Welcome to the Sales Influence Podcast, where we talk about finding the why in how people buy. I'm your host, Victor Antonio. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for lending me those wonderful ears. And if you're watching us on YouTube or any video platform, thank you for lending me those eyeballs. Today, I got somebody who's going to talk ABM. We're going to talk about Challenger. We're going to talk about getting to the C-suites. We're going to talk about what salespeople are doing wrong. And to help me do that, please welcome Christina Jaramillo. How are you doing, Christina? Oh, thank you so much for saying that correctly. It, it, I hear it so few, so rarely that it, it's it's like a refresher. It's refreshing. <laughs> well, by the way, truth be told, when I was a kid, our doctor, our go-to doctor was Dr. Jaramillo. No way. So, <laughs> I love it. So I was, like, I was like, oh, I know that name really easy. Christina, let the Sales Influence Tribe know who you are and a little background before we jump into today's content. Yeah. So as you said, Christina Jaramillo, I am president of Personal ABM and Stop the Sales Drop. Uh, Personal ABM is a our sales and marketing execution arm of the business where we work with SaaS, um, B2B tech and logistics and supply chain and then the tech in those industries to win, protect and expand key accounts. And Stop the Sales Drop is our education and events arm. Um, just because we, we saw that the 2020 was a turbulent year, to say the least. Um, and we saw revenue drop in our own business. So we figured we'd help other B2B sales marketing uh, leaders, uh, C-suite leaders kind of figure out what to do next and learn from like a peer community. And it's been really fun to learn from other people, see what they're doing um, and not as negative in such a crazy world. So it's good to hear some mm -hmm. positive stories and to learn from leaders. So that has been a, an aspect of our business that we started just this year. Um, so that is interesting as well, but I'm so me, active me, on LinkedIn. That's me. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I wanted to ask you something because, you know, you, when I, when you gave me your feedback, you reached out and then I was like, well, let me just research her a little bit. And I was like, <laughs> I think I kind of like this. I think this could go well. And so since the pandemic, you know, what have you been, can you think of like one example? I said, Victor, here's a company that here's what they were going through. Here's what the pandemic did to them. And here's how we had to really help them. Give me something like that. Well, you know, it's interesting. We were working with a marketing organization that was targeting QSRs, so quick service restaurants. And they had a lot of conversations going in Q1. Q1 looked really awesome for them, like a lot of companies. And they were engaging with uh, decision makers at these QSRs for like companies like Chick-fil-A and uh, other organizations that they could integrate their service with. Um, and, you know, they were uh, having a hard time with it uh, when March hit, but they were able to regenerate those conversations just by shifting to helping versus um, trying to sell or trying to um, pitch so much. So I, I'm sure a lot of salespeople can relate to that, that when you become um, more of a value partner and you're selling, sharing relevant info, that's going to make your sales conversations a lot more powerful and it's going to be more engaging and it, it changes the relationship and the dynamic. I love it. The, you know, I, I should have started here because I think this is, a, a, by the way, I want to continue with this storyline, but maybe I, I just thought as you were talking, I go, do people really understand account-based marketing? Not that it's a, a new concept. It's been around, you know, for, you know, in different forms, let's just say yeah. that. But now it's almost like it's come back to the forefront as, Hey, let's focus. Can you explain to people what is account-based marketing? And then why should you really, really pay attention to account-based marketing in this B2B world? Absolutely. Um, so account-based marketing is when you are targeting specific organizations that you want to win or close, uh, organizations that you want to protect that are maybe, you know, teetering or not as, as strong of a relationship with, or you want to expand those accounts. That's where ABM or account-based marketing really comes into play. And in B2B, since the sales cycle is so long and some of these investments are very big, it's going to be, has to be a strategic approach and ABM makes it, um, is a strategic approach. So you're developing content and messaging for the actual sales conversation that you want to have because traditionally sales and marketing kind of speaks at industries, but with ABM, you can actually speak to the organization. So speak to the individual within a named account as opposed to speaking to personas. I love that. The, you know, you, you said two things that are key. First of all, B2B, very focused, go in, look at what your target market is, right? I, I figure that's the big step, right? Who are you targeting? And within that, who are you specifically targeting, the personas and what conversations are we having? But you said something interesting that sometimes because of the long sales cycles, 
you know, I always say there's four ways to grow your business, right? You got you can acquire new customers, you can retain, you can upsell, cross sell, and then you can maybe reignite some people who haven't bought in the past. And you hit on two of them. You said one is penetrate, right, which is acquire new clients, and then you also said expand. Walk me through an example. Uh, let's take the penetration, grad, getting a new account. I'm a B2B company. I, I want some new accounts. How can ABM, the approach that you offer, help me? Walk me through that. Uh, so I, I, one of the things that we like to think about is that every interaction is as many sales conversation. So whether that's social, which is what a lot of people are using right now because we're forced digitally um, to use digital platforms, or whether that's email or, um, you know, other electronic forms of communication, you have to make sure that you're always pen, uh, speaking or sharing value at every step. And what I've noticed is a lot of people, salespeople in particular on social are not very relevant because they're speaking about um, their role, their personal KPIs, their quotas achieved, their awards achieved. You know, I won President's Club. I've had exceeded quota for X, Y, Z many years. Um, and that's great if you're looking for a new role. But if you're trying to sell or create relationships with people and you're not showing them value, it's going to put up that wall um, that's going to create a disconnect. So I, I think that's where people need to start is everything that I'm doing. Am I sharing re relevant value at every touch point? Because, I, I, you know, you got, I know you've got these emails or these in, uh, in mail uh, uh, texts from people who talk about, hey, looked at your profile. Uh, sounds like we have a lot of things in common. Let's connect. Can we get on a call? So see what type of synergies we can create. And I'm like, are you kidding me? You know, generic. Yeah, very, very generic. And so how do you help people? Because I, they, I know there's people listening to this podcast who are guilty of that, Christina. They're guilty of that. And so, so you know, how do you reform these people? I mean, just, let's just say, like, how do you reform these people? Well, okay. So... Put yourself in the buy in the buyer or your customer or your prospect shoes for a second. If you were talking about, if the person that you were was trying to reach out to was talking about themselves and what was in it for them personally and not you, you wouldn't want to engage with them. So you have to show that you're aligned with buyers priorities, especially now that priorities have changed given 2020 and you, you're aligned with the challenges they face. You have to see that you're telling a relevant business story for your prospects, for your customers, um, so that you can make that emotional human to human connection because it's all about relationships, uh, especially on digital. I mean, I don't if you don't know me or you don't um, you know anything about me, you have to show that up front that you understand who I am um, and what I'm going through. And you need to, you know, also showing value is also teaching for differentiation. I know you had mentioned Challenger. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. But you have to talk, uh, share how you fill an account or market gap that they might have in their business or in their um, role or in their organization. And the personal impacts that you your, and you can, you can help fill uh, or personal impacts that they can have with this new solution or new um, offering that you can help them change and overcome these challenges. Why Why is it that some of these salespeople that reach out, by the way, I'm with you 100%. I'm tracking with you 100%. Why is it that, I don't want to use the word lazy, but it's a good word because, you know, they, they don't take the time to research these, you know, highly valued targeted companies that they're going after. And as you've pointed out, you know, there is no empathy in terms of what they're sharing to fill that value gap. You say, why do you think is it, why do you think that happens? Is it salespeople are lazy? That's too easy. They don't have the content. Maybe they're not supported by their company. What have you seen that maybe that's why salespeople don't do it? Why don't they do it? That's been what that's been bothering me. Like, why don't they do it? It's so obvious. Why? I, I think it might come down from leadership because they're just not taught to, to put themselves in the customer's shoes and think of it from that perspective. I mean, if you come in, I mean, if you come to me and just talk about why your features and benefits are so great, why your organization is so great, how many years you've been in business, all the awards that you've won, that's great. But how does that help me at the end of the day? Uh, how does that help me achieve my goals? How does that make my life in my role better? How does that make my goals more attainable and more achievable? And how does that make all the metrics that are important to me as a buyer? Uh, you know, how do, how do I get to those but with your solution or offering or whatever it is that you're trying to sell me? So, so if if I'm I'm that persona people are targeting, right? I'm the VP of marketing, or, or I'm a CMO, doesn't matter. And I know that I'm getting all these emails, right? You know, 
how do I do it? How do I how do how do I stand out when I know that that CMO, whatever it is, CTO, CIO, is getting all these emails and people are talking about their KPIs. They're talking about their positioning statements. What have you seen that works? That you know some maybe some tactics or strategy that say you know this is a little different than anybody else. And if you do this, you might stand a chance of grabbing somebody's attention. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so like we were talking about a little earlier about organizing or deciding who your target accounts are, writing, let's say, let's start with your LinkedIn profile. Um, if you want to win Oracle, for example, then you have to write your profile for Oracle, not accounts like Oracle. The more specific you are, the more relevant your profile and your messaging becomes. Um, and you know, like I mentioned earlier, you have to have intention. There needs to be a reason behind the info in your profile. Every message you write, where you're focused on the interaction, the experience that you want the prospects to have. So I'm gonna just go through a bunch of questions that people might wanna ask themselves and how they would answer it. And you, whatever answer they have to these questions, it's what they can use to fill their profile. Um, and, 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 and any messaging, they, they, it's like a framework of the messaging they can use, you know, so that's, you know, this isn't a tactical um, checklist. It's more of, um, it gets you think about it so you make it more strategic. So what is your profile, your content or your messaging's main intention? get specific, get as specific and quantifiable as you can, because that's going to set you apart. And, you know, who is the ideal customer that you want to speak to? You might not necessarily know. It, it, it boggles my mind that some people don't necessarily know that already. I mean, that's, I would think where you would start from ground one. Otherwise, you just start talking to everyone and anyone. Um, you know, what are the accounts that you want to get? Get specific. Don't say, I want accounts like Google, or I want accounts that look like Oracle. Name the ones you want and write your profile content and messaging for those accounts. And again, you know, we were talking about roles or, you know, different people in the buying committee who, you know, what are the roles that you're speaking to and what's important to them? So if you're targeting a CRO, what is important to him? What is he going to care about at the end of the day? What is going to make his job easier? What is going to make him reach his, 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 um, his goals? What is going to make his organization you know, um, more successful? How can you help? And what insights can you share that others in similar roles, uh, you know, that you've had maybe customer stories, um, the challenges that they made a fate, they might have faced because of specific gaps. So you're, you're, you're mentioning or using a story to create, um, show something that's maybe similar. Gotcha. So we talk about intention. We start out, what is our intention when we go on LinkedIn to what, who are our target I guess the personas that we're going after, right? What are the titles we going after? And then the name of the companies, and that's not only the name of the companies, I'm sure in there, you probably go through the whole, what does that company look like? You know, annual revenues, years in business, so forth and so on. So we know that today, and the numbers change depending on which study you read, that the number of decision makers is nine to 11. You know, that's yeah. kind of the new number right now. And so how do you, as a salesperson, manage this? Because now, let's say I do have 11 you know, decision makers, influencers that are part of the decision making process in this B2B sales cycle. But I also want to target a portfolio of, let's say, 20 companies. I can do the math real quick, 20 times 11. That's a lot. And so what do you recommend for salespeople? Like, what's their cadence? How often should they reach out? What should they be doing? And how should they be tracking that? Well, definitely CRM should be used for tracking. Cadence, um, you know, I don't have a specific, like, every three days do the XYZ. It's more of, are you getting engagement? Meaning, are they engaging with you besides just connecting? So let's say I reached out to you, Victor, and you connected with me, mm -hmm. and then I send you a follow-up nurture message. If you don't engage with that message, maybe give it a week or so and try again. If it mm -hmm. doesn't work, try again. But you have to also, what's important is not the cadence so much as what you're actually sharing. So mm -hmm. if I'm reaching out to you, Victor, and I send you a nurture message and my nurture message is, here's an article that I thought would be great for you, or here's a case study that you might like. Mm -hmm. Why should I read that case study? You have to show me what it is that's most important because articles could be long, case studies could be long, or things that aren't necessarily important or relevant to me in those particular pieces of content. I need to know where you, you want me to go. If you show me where you want to go, look at page six on this about X, Y, Z. And I think it's important to you because, not because I think this is a great piece and you should just read it because then you're just sending content to send it out as opposed to having that intent that we've been talking about and sharing value. 
I'm more likely to engage with you if you send me value because then I say, oh, you're not going to quickly try to get me on a demo call right after connecting. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you are not going to send me your calendar link right after connecting because apparently a lot of salespeople that I've noticed think that because I accept their connection, I'm automatically a right fit and I want to <laughs> book demo calls. And, yeah. and I'm sure you've seen it and I'm sure your oh. audience has definitely seen it. Well, well I, lo I love that. that. That's a cool quick tip because I, I, I'm with you 100% that if you just send somebody an article, a case study, whatever it may be, and you say, hey, I think this is an interesting article. But if you don't have, as you pointed out rightly so, that because, here's why I think, because that lets you know that you're thinking with them. And I think that's what people want to feel. And I think that's, I, I love that. Out of curiosity, I got to ask this question, guys, between us. You don't have to tell, just between us. You know, just be on this podcast. No one will hear this, no, right? No one will hear this. <laughs> Is there, is there, when you look at a technology stack, like, you know, what are some of you, can I ask you for some of your recommendations, you know, to manage some of this stuff? You, we, we, we know there's CRMs out there. Is, is there, is there one that you just use? Not that it's your favorite or it's the best, that one that you use. Is there other pieces of technology that you use to begin to manage all this stuff? You know, like what are some of the tools that these folks can use to actually get into this ABM game and stay in? You know, well, we're, since we're so focused, we're not so, um, you know, ABM has kind of been morphed into different things, like account-based awareness, and mm -hmm. that, that's great. That's one part of it, but our, uh, and that's where other tools come in, like ABM uh, tools like Terminus and um, Demand-based, those are great for those kind of campaigns, but then are uh, ways that you want to target. But if people aren't responding to those messages, that's where the kind of personal approach that we take. Um, because every message is personal to the per the individual, uh, personal to the individual that we're engaging with. So it's all manual. But if I had to tell you some tech that I use, I particularly like Pipedrive for CRM just to see what was said in a nurture message maybe that I sent to a prospect and what maybe I should, it, it, they didn't respond to that kind of message. Let me try another approach. Mm -hmm. And if they responded to me, I want to make sure that I have that response captured so that I know you know, notes of next time I interact with them, you know, when we spoke six, or, you know, we exchanged messages six months ago, you said this so that I'm actually paying attention. Um, and there's some relevance again in the next communication. And the person knows that they're not just another number or they're just not another copy and pasted email that I sent them. Yeah, I think they need to know that. By the way, I'm a, I'm a fan of Pipe Tribe as well. Great, great platform. What type of messages have you seen from your personal experience, just an opinion, from your personal opinion, opinion seem to get a response from a given persona? You know what? The ones that are from when we work with clients, the ones that get the most is when the message is tailored and the person comes back and says, it sounds like you were writing that article or that case study for me. So that's like the best kind of message or the best compliment that we can get when we're creating any kind of message that it's so relevant to what that individual is is challenged with, how you can help them and you know, you know why it's happening. If you can answer all those, you know, what when and why type of questions for them, that that's the kind of messaging that that really resonates and is relevant to the actual person. Um, those are the ones that get the most engagement and response. Have, have you noticed though, you know, being more specific, have you noticed that, you know, Victor, when I talk about how I can help them reduce their operating costs, or when I talk about one, I can, you know, and I know it depends. I know yeah, it depends, yeah. but just in general, I mean, some, give us some hints, some guidance yeah, here. The ones that are qual uh, quantified. So if I say I can help you reduce operating costs, that's great. So can your competitors probably. If I can help you reduce operating costs by 25% and we've done it with an organization that looks just like yours and then name uh, the organization or allude to what the organization does that you could say, oh, this is something you know similar to what we're going through, then that makes it more, oh, I can see myself in this. I can see myself using the solution and maybe benefiting from this solution or offering or software, but if you just say a generic thing like reducing costs, uh, becoming more streamlined, uh, my favorite in tech is better people, process, and technology, which means what exactly? I've still yet to figure out, <laughs> um, but it has to be quantified. And if you can get really, really specific with results that way, give me a number um, or give me a range or give me a dollar amount, that's gonna get more engagement for what we've seen from our side of 
when we do our own messaging as a company, but also for our clients as well, the more quantified they get, it's not just a basic claim, it's an actual provable claim. I, I love it because you, you know, two things. One, it's believable, right? Yeah. If you quantify it, it's believable. And second, if you can, this is an obvious one, but I get people miss it, is that if I can do it within an industry that's very similar to yours, it's even, now I believe it'll work for me, right? I believe it, now I believe it also will work for me. So your organization, who do you typically work with? Who comes to you says, Christina, help me? Who typically comes to you? Typically, it's uh, senior leadership sales and marketing in B2B tech, SaaS, and then logistics, 3PL, and then the SaaS within those industries. Mm -hmm. um, they either have one or th one of three things that they want to achieve or mm -hmm. maybe all three. You know, we have particular accounts that we want to win that have been, um, you know, we maybe got some engagement within the last year or so, but then they kind of went quiet. Um, okay. We have accounts that we know we can win that are similar to other accounts that we've, you know, that uh, that we've had great success with. So we'll have great customer stories and, and examples, or we have um, accounts that we want to protect because we you know we've, they've been working with us for X amount of years, but we know that they're going to RFP and they're shopping around. Interesting. Um, Cause we don't have it. We don't have engagement with necessarily decision makers, but we have engagement with the people that are using our software or people that are, um, you know, implementing our solution. So we need to get the decision makers and see how it, that solution is, 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 is working and affecting different levels of the company. So why they should continue to work with um, a, a, our clients and then when protect and then, Oh, exp um, expand. Okay. So we, you know, we have an account that we know we have great relationship with for one particular solution, but there's so much more that we have to offer them and we have to show them the value, whether that's within that particular department in the organization, or maybe another department that would use another offering or solution that we have. Yeah. I love that. By the way, very similar to my way of thinking, right? You want to acquire, win new clients, right? The protect, that's basically retention right there. Expanding, that's the upselling and the cross-selling. So I love that. So this is really interesting. So the protect piece is interesting, you know, because, yeah, walk me through that. I'm just curious because I've, I've never really thought about having to protect my client if they're going to RFPs or putting out some new bids on the streets. Yeah. So, for example, we had a client... Um, a technology, a logistics 3PL company that, that they offered a technology piece. So um, they had a client that they had for years and they said, oh, we have a great relationship with them. You know, the, the people that are using it were actually in the operations department. So, you know, they love our, they love our, um, our solution. They can't praise us enough, but the actual people that are signing off on renewing or expanding that particular contract are not necessarily in operations. It might be C-level. Um, it might be higher up than maybe the director. So they they knew that it, they had heard from the person that they had as a contact that they were shopping around because they were trying to cut costs. So what they were able to do is is show the value that they were use, um, the client had gained by staying with them and the potential for future growth where areas that they, that they hadn't dis, uh, previously discussed um, lie. And they were able to protect it and even expand the account because of that. Um, and it was just that they had taught them something they didn't know previously. So they were teaching for that differentiation part of the challenger that you had alluded to earlier um, and how that differentiation, you know, only leads back to the, this one solution. You know, no one else can do it the way we do it. So it's the how we do things, not necessarily, um, you know, how is what makes the, the, the solution different. Yeah, you're reminding me, have you ever, have you read uh, the expansion sale by Tim Reister? Over at Corporate Visions? No, I, I've heard of it, but I haven't read that one. I'm sure it's great. Fantastic read because it, it's all about messaging and sequencing. And, mm -hmm. and what you basically said is a lot of what's in there already. It's kind of you blended the challenger and the expansion sale. You slammed them together kind of thing. And so, so I love that because it, it is fascinating. How do you hold people since you've been working with them? What's the messaging like? And so they help you with the structure a little bit. So I think that's pretty interesting. So – when you look at protecting, right, protecting, when we look at expanding now, if we're trying to get them to buy more, you know, now what type of connection? Is it similar? Is it pretty much the same approach here? Because I know we're protecting. We have contacts, so we know somebody. If we're expanding, we have contacts. So is it, is it a similar messaging or different? It's a similar messaging. I mean, it also depends on the solution you you might 
fit, I mean, uh, might be trying to upsell them with, but you have to give them the value as to why. So almost you have to, uh, I learned this, um, this from Julie Thomas at Value Selling Associates. She says, you have to tell them what their million dollar headache is mm -hmm. or show them what their million dollar headache is. So when they go to buy your six or seven figure solution, it looks like a no brainer. Yeah. Yeah. It so looks like a buy yeah. <laughs> Exactly. It looks like, like it looks like a cheap vitamin versus yeah, it looks like a, a crazy migraine. Yeah. Yeah. Some people sell you could either sell painkillers or vitamins. It, take your pick. You know, it's it's so so. How did you get started? When you talked about you know stopping the sales drop, you know, how did that concept come about? Was it pre-pandemic or you know is it post-pandemic? You know, walk me through your thought process as you're building this program out. Yeah, it's just interesting. Um, Stop the Sales Drop was the title for a book that we were going to write this year. Uh, obviously, priorities shifted. Um, so, you know, we just happened to see, you know, a revenue drop in our own business at the end of Q1 because we were on on target for an awesome 2020. And I was super excited and just like everyone, that wall kind of just fell. fell and um, we're like, so what are we going to do internally and how are we going to help our customers and our audience kind of turn this around. Um, so we created that Stop the Sales Drop, which is a, uh, a free community of articles and videos and podcasts and just learning from people that are living it and what they're doing and the shifts that they're making to mm -hmm. reboot their organization. I mean, we even started a Reboot Friday where we're talking with um, sales, senior sales leaders, marketing leaders, revenue people, so C-suite and VPs at all these tech organizations and software organizations that we 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 follow and we want to learn from but also possibly you know maybe we could work with eventually so that was kind of our 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 take as um as an inbound cuz an inbound for our particular business as well but also to learn because we typically for the last 10 years or so that we've been in business we've always taken the account based approach and done outbound mm -hmm. um but we kind of shifted this year just based on on changes in the market. Yeah, I think I personally I think the market has been changing for a little bit now when it comes to inbound. I think we're, this this pandemic has made a hard right turn towards that because everybody's yep. overwhelmed. When you're working with some of these companies or companies come to you uh, on the inbound side, it says, "Hey, you know, I want to hire you. Here's kind of our problem. Here's our situation. What have you found in terms of adoption by this these new strategies, new way of thinking, this ABM mindset with salespeople? What have you found?" You know, I think depending, I mean, typically, like I said earlier, we work with senior level salespeople. So once the senior person gets it, and usually it's not mm -hmm. as hard of a, of a sell for them, it kind of trickles down as long as they're getting, uh, once they start seeing the results, the senior level starts seeing the results, then the it, it trickles down to their, um, throughout the marketing, or excuse me, the sales department, because they're seeing results. So then, oh, we should adopt this type of approach. Right. Uh, because this this typical approach is because it's so strategic and such a long, um, because of long selling cycles, it's it's something that you have to know that it's not going to be a quick fix. It's not going to be, I'm going to get it results in 30 days. It typically takes at least a quarter to see the results. So that's why senior people are usually the first to adopt it and then trickle down. Yeah. And how do you build how do you build the content or help companies build the content for the value messages that they're going to be sending? Or, you know, how do you teach them how to engage? We're talking about the salespeople, of course, because, you know, to some people, they don't have the skills. I don't know how to reach out. I don't know what my content really is. I don't know what my value message messaging should be. How do you help them with that? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so we typically are creating content that's for the sales conversation you want to have. So what is it that you want to get across when you're engaging with a prospect? What is the value you want them to get from um, your conversation? And then we would create maybe an article or a case study or something that speaks directly to that account, hence why we're so targeted uh, and why this is such a long play. because. If you can't, you have to figure out what that conversation you want to have is, and then we can develop the content for you. And then sequence it out. Correct. And so if I'm, a, if I'm a company that comes to you, what do I typically, I mean, what's the question I'm trying to ask? Like, I want articles, I want videos, I want podcasts. You know, what do you give me that I can use? You know, what? Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to figure out, by the way, people listening to this, I want them to reach out to you and say, okay, here's <laughs> what you can get. Here's what you offer. So if I come to you, I go, help, Christina. You know, what can you help me build? 
you got articles, blogs. What else can you help me build to help me with my messaging? Yeah, uh, case studies, white papers, frameworks, because I can't give you a template because that, that goes against everything that we, we stand for. <laughs> <laughs> it has to be a framework and then you voice it, you know, you, you change it to sound like you. Um, mm -hmm. And you also want to make sure that the value that you're communicating, whether it's through an email or through LinkedIn or um, through any kind of outreach that you're doing is the same value that you're having in an actual one on one conversation, because then there's that disconnect. So we will mm -hmm. give you a framework of what to talk about and what to discuss and, and what key points you want to hit. But it can't be templated and it can't be cookie cutter because if it was cookie cutter, then everyone would do it. Yeah, no, I hear you on that one. How do you, let's say I come to you, I'm bending knees, so to speak, and said, okay, Victor, here's some, Kate, based on what your intention is, here's some messaging, here's some, here's some, here's a framework, uh, here's some case studies, some blogs, some articles we put together. How do we test, or how do you test the, the effectiveness of it? You know, do you do some like split testing, or do you just, do you come back 30 days later, let's get some feedback, let's look at the response? How do you measure that stuff? Yeah, so let me give you an example. Um, so we typically what we would do is let's say a client has we're working with a client and we're trying to gain some traction. They have some contacts within the organization, but they haven't really decided to engage further, you know, actually on a one on one, whether it's video used to be in person, obviously. Mm. Um, you know, what why are they not you have to diagnose why are they not engaging? Are you not giving them any information or uh, value are do you are you not saying that you understand what's going on in their company if you give them a different way of looking at something and giving them value along the way then that's going to be how, how that's you're going to change it and get them to interact with you so you know once you get that conversation if you're not paying attention taking diligent notes of what's what they're agreeing to what they're challenged with um, what they're actually saying then it's hard to create maybe that next piece of content that might supplement the 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 follow-up message that you want to send or follow-up conversation that you want to have. So we had to take those insights and then develop that relevant content with the insights that the salesperson was able to capture um, with that one-on-one -on -one meeting. Yeah, because the, the biggest frustration salespeople have, obviously, is that maybe there's that first, the first connection is good, second messaging is good, and then whoosh, ghosted, Yeah, right? You're like, what happened? And, and so what typically happens, well, I won't tell, you'll tell me, why does that typically happen? Um, because you were probably treating them, um, the prospect like a a number and doing that templated cadence. So they were like, okay, I, I see value in connecting from you, but you're not, you know, it's contributing to um, my every day. You're not contributing. I don't see value in, in connecting further. So, you know, I'm not going to engage. I'm not going to respond. I'm not going to say, let's jump on a call type of thing. Um, because you probably personalized quote unquote, by saying, uh, you know, I understand people that are in your role at in this industry fit this have or having this X, Y, Z problem, as opposed to saying, I've heard that what's going on in your company, naming the actual company and saying that this is happening. And maybe you've heard from whoever you heard it from, or you read an article and you heard it from, or you saw it in the news that this is happening in your company. I think you're having this type of issue. You know, you, that that's a little more personal to the individual versus a template that was probably what happened that you got ghosted. Yeah. I mean, by the way, and you, you bring up a great point when there's trigger events out there in the market that relate to these companies, that's the moment to pounce on trying to, you know, connect because maybe there's a way in based on that trigger moment. And I've always like, like tell me if you agree, Christian, I've always like there's customized and there's personalized customized for a market an industry or a company, but personalized that's for the persona. You know, like really get in there. So my question is, if I want to now get personal, you know, how should I interact with people? Forget about messaging for a second. But, you know, there are people who are posting comments. They may be my personas are posting comments, maybe posting an article. What can I do there to maybe begin to get some engagement or some traction with them? Yeah, if you see, let's say you see a prospect that you're trying to get, um, like you said, engagement with is posting an article, don't click like, don't click write, uh, don't write a comment and says, great job, good article, I totally <laughs> agree with you, thanks for posting, thanks for sharing. Lovely, That's lovely just messing article. with, yeah, that's just messing with algorithms and I don't really think it gets anything. 
uh, for you. You have to actually share value. You know, I saw that this article was important because it, it emphasized this or it showcased this. Put your spin on it, add value to the article. And before you hit share or send, read that little blurb that you're adding. Is there actual value in there or is it just fluff? Because if it's fluff, then delete it and don't share it. Right. I've seen people do that. Great article. I'm like, well, what's so great about it? But people who say specifically in this article, da, 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 I like that. And I also like people, tell me if I'm wrong, I like when people can analyze an article or a post and then ask me a tough question. Mm -hmm. I don't know why, but I love that. Because it gets what you, to you think, to that? it gets you thinking, that's why. Yeah. Yeah. And it shows yeah. you um, a different way of, of, of looking at something that maybe you read this, the same article and you didn't see it that way. Uh, so it's giving you a new viewpoint instead of just agreeing with everyone. I mean, there's tons of people, especially like when it comes to C-suite decision makers, they have tons of people that want to be their friends. They have tons of people that want to connect with them, tons of people that want to uh, have a, a video or in-person meeting with them. They, they don't need more friends. They need someone that's going to give them value. And, you know, they even have people that they work with every day that are really, you know, maybe agreeable with them because they don't want to challenge them. They don't want to um, create waves. But as a salesperson, that's a great opportunity for you to create these waves, to get them to think differently, because then they're going to say, oh, you're not just actually trying to pitch me or sell me. You're actually giving me value and you're, um, you know, being someone that I, I should engage with or I should learn from or I should want to interact with. Yeah, I always think, and I knew you would use the word, and you did, challenge. I knew you would use the word challenge. I knew you would use it. And, but I also think there's this, this, this touch of curiosity that if you read something, it goes, I wasn't clear on this. Can you elaborate on that? Because it didn't really make sense to me. I mean, find a gentle way of saying it. What, what are your thoughts on just things of that nature? Yeah, I mean... I as long as you're adding value to it as well and sharing and not just posting a question saying, okay, I interpreted it maybe as this, is that what you were going for? Or is that what you were? Clarification. Wanted? Yes, exactly. Clarification. Love it. Because you just might've interpreted something incorrectly or you might've missed the the, bat, the ball All right. altogether. I think we got three C's in there. We got, we got challenge. You can be curious and then you could ask for clarification. We got three C's in there. We're good enough. What, what do you see some of the, uh, we'll start wrapping up. What do you see are some of the, the big no, no, do not do this that a lot of people are actually doing. A lot of salespeople are doing that are, it really undermines their, their brand, quote unquote. What are they doing that they shouldn't be doing? They're not focusing on why someone should trust them. So for example, if you're a salesperson and we talked about it earlier, you're talking about me, me, me in my profile, me, me, me in my invite to connect or my nurture message or any kind of interaction, then as a buyer, I don't understand why I would want to trust you because I know you're just trying to close me. I'm just trying to be another um, notch on your sales belt, so to speak. So you have to worry, think about whatever you're doing. Am I building trust at every step of the way? Am I building a business case? Don't talk about your features and benefits because those are secondary, maybe even tertiary of your solution or offering. Um, why I need to trust you and why I should value you, those are everything you do should answer those questions. And if they don't, mm -hmm. before you hit send, before you hit connect, then rethink what you're doing. Oh, I agree. I, th I think it's, I don't want to oversimplify this, but I think it's simple. If you put yourself in the other person's shoes and you understand the pain that they're going through, all the crap that they're having to deal with, all the stuff that they have to worry about, and then really take that in terms of as context for whatever message you sent out, maybe that's a good starting point. Yep. And I think people are afraid. You tell me if I'm wrong, Christina. I think salespeople are 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 are, are just chicken. I want to say sissies, but I'll just say chicken, because they they don't want to challenge. They want to be passive, almost like passive aggressive. You know what I mean? Yeah. But I think I think what leaders want, I think what real thought leaders want, is that all right. Question me. Ask me something I don't know. Tell me something I don't know. Help me understand. As you say, give me that insight, that information beyond the obvious. Tell me something that makes me go, huh? Never looked at it that way. And until you start doing that, you're not going to get anybody's attention. You'll just be connect and they'll just put you into the into the pipeline. 
That makes sense. No, that totally makes sense. I, I on the other, uh, you know, you're, you're lucky. That if was my, you even... that was, by the way, that was my mini rant, by the way. That was my mini rant. <laughs> no, I liked it. I mean, you're lucky if you even get a connection because I ignore so many people if, if their message just says, I can help you do this. And I, 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 mm -hmm. it's really yeah. hard. So I, I know mm -hmm. that if I'm ignoring it, I'm sure other people are, are ignoring it. And, you know, there was a, a Harvard Business Review that I saw, a study came out that, um, C-suites only engage with vendors for about 2% of their week, which is like less than an hour or about mm -hmm. an hour, give or take. And that means you're also competing with other vendors as well. So if you're wasting your engagement time because you're not um, giving the, the C-suite or your decision maker or whoever you're trying to target value, um, mm -hmm. you're, it's going to be wrong. And, it, it, and you're not going to develop the conversation that you want to have. It's going to be have to be tr based on trust and value. Yeah, I, I was interviewing uh, Brent Adamson, one of the guys who wrote the Challenger. He's now with Gartner. Mm -hmm. What is he called? A VP of Distinguished VP of something. I was I was giving him smack for that, but anyway. So he's he reminded me that one of the studies that people are, companies are only spending about what is it, fifteen or seventeen percent of the time with vendors, and as you pointed out. You know, during their whole search buying process, only fifteen to seventeen percent. But then you got to divide that by at least three vendors. Mm -hmm. You know, if not five, and then you get down to the numbers you're talking about. So you're absolutely right, and you only have that much time to engage. So, and and I think the way to stand out is to work with people like you on developing content. And I think a lot of salespeople don't know how to do that, and I think a lot of people are scared. And so, do you find that at times when you're working with companies? You know, you get the C-level you know, approval. They're like, yeah, we believe in this. We think it's a long it's a long game. We got that. But then as you start rolling this stuff out, how difficult is that? You know, I mean, how, yeah, how difficult is that to put a plan together to really lay out content framework for the next three to six months? How difficult is that for a company? Uh, well, it's, it's, it depends. It depends on how much support they're getting maybe for marketing, because typically that's where content creation is coming from. But we've, what we've seen is we're kind of the bridge in between sales and marketing, because a lot of marketing tends to be featured in benefit or why we're so great kind of information that, but that's needed for brand awareness um, and for, uh, you know, lead gen. Um, but sales is maybe having different conversation because they know the value that their customers are achieving. So we kind of, interview salespeople to see what's going on in their sales conversations. So, you know, walk us through what's happening in a typical conversation. Where are your prospects either hung up or what do they really, um, you know, they, they can't get past this, this part of your solution or where are they getting best success with? And then we can develop that conver content for that conversation that you're having, whether it's a, a customer expansion conversation or a new client uh, acquisition conversation. And salespeople typically know, I, by the way, I'm biased towards salespeople, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> they really know what, what the real issues are. Yes. I think marketing's got it down. Marketing's got it down in terms of understanding feature benefit advantage gain, right? Case studies, KPIs, got it, love it. Kiss, kiss, hug, hug. But the salespeople who are talking to the customers every day, especially in an expansion or a protective sales situation, they know the deal. And I think they have an inclination of what they need. So I love the fact that you say you sit right between both of them. It's almost like two people who don't want to talk to each other can't communicate. And you're like there as, as, as a therapist. Okay, kids, we have to get along. We have to figure this out, right? Something like that. <laughs> so anyway, so Christina, tell folks how they can get in touch with you and find out more about your company. Absolutely. Um, I invite you to connect with me on LinkedIn. So it's Christina with a K and Jaramillo or Jaramillo as I uh, Americanize it. Uh, depending who I'm talking to, it's uh, connect with me on LinkedIn, but give me a, do not give me that generic invite, let's connect, or we have similar content or connections, let's connect. Give me a reason to connect with you. Where did you find me or what did you find interesting? Give me some insight and I'd be sure to connect with you. Um, also check out personal ABM. Uh, that's my main organization. And then stop the sales drop is our education um and uh, events arm. We're doing a reboot Friday panels. This Friday, we're talking with um, customer experience leaders about rebooting the customer experience because that's all about uh, customer retention and expansion. I love that. Stop the sales drop. It's almost like stop the violence, people. Stop the sales <laughs> drop. This is getting bad. There's too much bleeding going on. Stop the sales drop. So what's your logo for that, by the way? What's your logo it's for actually, stop the sales uh, drop? It's actually, it's a big uh, word stop, and then it's got an arrow that goes up and to the right. In the okay. O. Okay. Okay. So it is, okay. Cool. <laughs> My head has so many ideas of where I could have gone with that. Oh, logo. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> 
All right, Christina, thank you for joining us. And that is it for the Sales Influence Podcast. Leave me some feedback on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, wherever you find me on this platform. Also, check out personalabm.com. Check out Christina Jaramillo. Uh, check out who she is. And again, if you're a company looking for that type of service, you need help in communicating, reaching out, and you got an ABM strategy that's a little weak, Christina is probably a person you should contact right away. And on that note, check out the Sales Velocity Academy at salesvelocityacademy.com. And lastly, I want to thank you for listening. This is Victor Antonio, always reminding you, sell it hard when you know how. Take care.